Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm talking with Chris Barone of Stratega Securities. We'll talk about some of the charts that he is focused on, trying to make sense of these markets, chopping all around. Yesterday, sort of a distributed feel to the tape. Today, nice rally in the morning, selling off in the afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The technical toolkit that we use on the Stock Charts platform is really designed to help you understand and uh, and uh, appreciate the movements in the markets. There is message embedded in price and breadth and sentiment and trend and momentum by analyzing the charts consistently with a good routine of analysis so they give a good chance of performing pretty well over the longer term. Now, in the short term, we've had sort of an eventful uh, stretch here uh, coming out of 2022 into 2023, sort of lights out moving to the upside. Now a little more nuance, right? A little more choppiness. Some of the groups that had been performing well, testing support, our major averages on a day like today, rallying and then selling off even within the uh, within the space of one particular session. Let's do our best to take a step back from the uh, what we call the flickering ticks of the market and focus on as much as we can the overall trends and those larger themes to pay attention to. Let's get into our market recap. I do want to start with a poll. As a reminder, we always have a poll going on our live stream page at stockcharts.com. Also on our social media accounts and our YouTube channel as well. We asked you recently, you decide you're bullish, then you start to look for supporting evidence. Which behavioral bias are you demonstrating? I am proud, Final Bar Nation, 86% of you correctly answered confirmation bias. And I will tell you, if you think that if you just invest long enough or that if you manage enough capital that you're immune to behavioral biases like confirmation bias, The bad news is it's just not the case. I've worked with some very successful investors and some very novice investors, and they all fall victim to that very, very common bias, which is basically you make the decision first, and then you try to gather evidence to essentially make yourself feel better, add conviction to something you're already going to do. What we talk about a lot using uh, on on the final bar is uh, focusing the market with fresh eyes every day, focusing on a consistent routine of analyzing charts and analyzing the evidence and focusing on what the weight of the evidence really supports. If you want to learn more about behavioral biases like confirmation biases, just go to our chart school section. We have a great uh, series on cognitive biases, including confirmation bias and others. Let's continue on with our market recap. As I mentioned, sort of a tale of two markets today, the morning session, pretty strong, really into the uh, early afternoon. The end of the day, the market sort of coming back. The S&P just barely, narrowly missing 4,000 before rotating lower. S&P closing of the day just below 39.70. It's down about a third of a percent from yesterday. The Nasdaq spent most of the day in the positive, but with the sell-off in the afternoon actually just finished below the zero level and the Dow leading the way down about 0.7%. This is one of those interesting days where you can see the VIX actually moving lower. And I think that's an important thing to remember. A lot of times I'm, I'm asked questions Uh, that imply that there is just this obvious inverse relationship between the S&P and the VIX. And over time, generally speaking, you're not wrong, but they are not literally an inverse of one another. And you will have days like today where the market moves lower on declining volatility. It's just the nature of what the VIX is measuring. It's, It's called the fear gauge. I would say better described as an uncertainty gauge. Uh, but it's not necessarily just moving the opposite of uh, of the S&P. There's a lot of nuance to the VIX uh, as well. So overall, volatility actually declined through the course of the day before rallying uh, in the uh, in the afternoon. The VIX still down uh, from yesterday's close. Interest rates ended up being mixed, although for most of the day, rates were higher. Um, again, through the course of the afternoon, things all started a started mean revert from what we saw earlier on in the day. 10-year yields actually finished a little bit below where they were yesterday's close, uh, with the 10-year yield currently around 392. The dollar index moving up about a third of a percent and bond prices, of uh, of course, moving higher. Commodities, for the most part, in the green. You have gold and silver both up. The GLD was up about half a percent. The silver ETF SLV up one and a half percent. Crude oil, natural gas, 
gasoline futures, all of those moving uh, moving to the upside. In cryptocurrencies, a uh, bit mixed as well. A lot of choppiness in these markets as usual. Uh, but at the end of the day, Bitcoin down about 1% to 23 to 30, Ethereum around 16, 25. We'll look at a daily chart of the S&P uh, really quickly just to see what happened today and how it fits into the bigger picture. The S&P for about five sessions has been right at its own 50-day moving average. And what's happened is you have sort of that weird configuration where both the 50 and the 200-day are right around the same level. Now, I will apologize once again for the number of lines I've drawn on the chart. Um, I was funny, I was talking with uh, our guest today, Chris Verone, before the show, just about the challenges of trying to figure out what is happening because there are a lot of conflicting pieces of evidence out there in the markets. I have found that the more lines I draw on the chart of the daily S&P, the more not obvious the trend is, right? When I can draw this big line, as uh, John Mendelson, who's a longtime technical analyst, used to say, I love, I love trends you don't need your glasses to see. I don't know if that's necessarily the case right now, right? You have the S&P having rallied and made a new swing high in February, now pulling back to moving average support. Currently at the 50-day moving average, uh, two days ago, we actually tested the 200-day moving average, which is currently around 3940. If you draw a trend line using the intraday lows off of the October low, we broke that uh, about four days ago. But if you use the closes, we're actually holding it just fine. The RSI is uh, below 50, but it's still okay, right? It's above 40, it's still kind of hanging in there, right about the same level we had in the pullback in December. So if we were looking for some clear answers, I don't know if I have them on the chart of the daily S&P right now. I see a move that has been higher off of the October lows, but now it is either sort of at that perfect pullback situation at the lower end of a trend channel coming back to the, uh, the mid-October of, uh, of last year period, or this is a breakdown. And again, it's all about what happens uh, right around these key levels that we've been talking about uh, here in recent weeks. Now, in terms of sectors and what's been moving, you can see today, most of the sectors actually down on the day is about two for one. Um, materials up the most, about 0.4%, followed by communication services and financials, just a little bit above the zero level. Underperforming today, you have utilities down 1.7%. Energy down 1.5%, consumer staples and healthcare both down uh, around 0.8%. So uh, in general, materials are an, are an interesting area. We've talked about uh, some random stocks within those groups. Um, steel names come to mind as a group we've talked about. One of our charts we'll feature a little later in today's show is from that uh, from that particular group. Uh, on the downside, you have a fairly defensive uh, group of sectors in the form of consumer staples and utilities, uh, for sure, uh, both kind of uh, underperforming today. Let's check in on breadth here to finish off our uh, market recap, and let's see what uh, color we can get from looking at market breadth. When we were looking at the advanced decline lines, this was one of our three and three charts yesterday. I like to look at the S&P and then uh, the advanced decline lines for four different groups of stocks. We have the common stock only advanced decline line. So a broad representation uh, of the New York Stock Exchange. Then we have large caps, mid caps and small caps. Now, if you'll notice the NYSE's advanced decline line, along with the mid cap and small cap AD lines are all arguably still in very much a bullish configuration, right? Made a new high at the beginning of February, pulled back a little bit so far in the month of February, but still overall, certainly in an uptrend, making higher highs and higher lows. The S&P's advanced decline line is actually the first, uh, and, and for now, the only one of the four advanced decline lines to actually break below its 50-day moving average, also to break below a trend line using the lows from October and December. So this is one of those weird kind of periods where the S&P is actually holding above trend line support for now. A lot of the advanced decline lines are as well, but the advanced decline line for the S&P 500, really representing the largest names in the uh, out of the four buckets has actually already broken down. That might be one of those important charts to uh, to watch. We highlighted that yesterday, and I would continue to say that's a, it's an interesting one to, uh, to follow. As today rotated lower, again, this chart sort of changed intraday as things were fluctuating, but by the close, with all three major averages finishing in the red, the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 closing above their 50-day moving average is down to around 43%. We're now below where we were at the December uh, corrective move here. You can see we got down to around 45%. We undercut that today uh, with, uh, with a number of stocks sort of breaking down their 50-day uh, moving average. If I'm bullish, I would say this is not a great check in the bullish column for the fact that the uh, that this indicator is breaking below 50%. It's one data point among money, but it basically tells you that most stocks in the S&P, over half, 
are below their 50-day moving average. And that means that a lot of names, instead of pulling back to a 50-day and bouncing higher, they're actually failing to hold that important level of support, just like the S&P itself, of course, has broken below its own 50-day moving average this week. Now, the longer-term gauge, which would be the percent above their 200-day moving average, still okay, right? Still around 58%. This is above the 50% level that we pulled back to in uh, in December. So at this point, it's telling you, uh, and again, to generalize short-term, you're seeing stocks break those short-term uh, you know, pullback gauges of the 50-day moving average, but still overall fairly constructive holding above their 200-day uh, moving averages. That's not too bad. Now, one of the other indicators we'll look at, which is derived from advanced decline data, is this colorful chart using the McClellan Oscillator. The McClellan Oscillator, if you're not familiar with it, is a breadth indicator basically based on advanced decline data. So you smooth it out with some exponential moving averages and you come up with this. It's essentially turning the advanced decline lines into like an RSI. So you're looking at momentum and seeing whether it's positive or negative. When this indicator goes below zero, what it basically tells you, generally speaking, is that the short-term uh, you know, momentum or short-term breadth is weaker than the longer term. And that's usually more characteristic of a, of a bearish or a corrective phase. And the way that you can see that is I've highlighted in red when we've gotten below that zero line. And you can see that for the most part, of course, that coincides with uh, prices moving lower. When the indicator is above zero, it's more constructive. And when you look at this chart, you can see that in January, we had lower lows in the McClellan oscillator as the market went higher into that high at the beginning of February. From there, of course, we rotated lower, got below the zero level, which is sort of the general sell signal from this indicator. And from there, of course, we've been uh, more in a pullback phase here in uh, in February. So while plenty of question marks certainly uh, remain, and, and I would say when we come back from the break, hopefully we'll, we'll look at some individual stocks that have had some and, and groups that have actually done very, very well and have held up a little bit. Overall, the conditions, I would say, generally speaking, mix with some of the breadth indicators that we follow most closely, giving less of a bullish signal than they have before. Folks, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with Chris Verone of Strategus. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we bring on our guest today, Chris Barone. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment on Friday's show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is the final bar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Coming up, we have some really good guests through the remainder of this week into next. On uh, tomorrow's show, on Wednesday, March 1st, we have Adrian Zadunchik. Adrian is the founder of a firm called The Burb Nest. He's a cryptocurrency expert, has a fantastic community of crypto traders and, uh, and analysts uh, to draw from. And we'll hear what he is thinking as cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ether have certainly seen some strength uh, year to date. Mary Ellen McGonigal of Simpler Trading is going to be coming on the show on Thursday, March 2nd. Next week on Tuesday, March 7th, we have Mike Zicardi, who's an investment writer, longtime contributor to StockCharts.com. And then next Wednesday, March 8th, our latest episode of The Pitch. I'll have Miss Schneider, Aaron Swenlin, and Mary Ellen McGonigal all sharing five pitches, five ideas, stocks or ETFs that they see are actionable right now. We'll hear their pitches and see uh, why they think those are particular bets you should be looking at. Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch for more information on that upcoming episode on March 8th. I want to welcome on today's guest, Chris Verone. Chris is a partner and head of technical and macro research at Strategus Research Partners in New York. Chris, welcome to the show. First time joining, and it's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, it's great to see you, Dave. There are certain things I miss greatly about my time at Fidelity, and having you and others come through uh, was certainly one of those things on my list of uh, of things that I miss uh, miss well, having the person. opportunity to enjoy. But I'll settle for this for now. And thanks for coming on, Chris. You're sure. you're we're starting with the S and P five hundred. We are talking the market recap about sort of this uncertainty, uh, and yeah. as the markets pull back off of the high from the beginning of February, what are you seeing when you're looking at the chart of the S and P here? You know, it's funny. Before we were talking, I said I. I think the only thing that's that's really overbought right now is conviction. There are <laughs> there are strong opinions on both sides here, and I think we ought to be humble enough to say, "Hey, we just don't quite know here." And I want to mm. keep kind of the the mind and the imagination open for what the path forward from here is, because I'm yeah. not sure the chart itself is particularly helpful in making that judgment. Um, this is not a monolithic tape. I mean, for every good thing I can show you. I can show you something that's equally as terrible uh, on the other side. Maybe it's a reminder that we actually have to do some real work for the first time in 10 years. That This isn't just zero interest rates and everything goes up or time will bail you out. 
you actually have to do some real work and pick some stocks. So I'm not sure there's a judgment one can make simply by looking at a sloppy chart uh, at the moment. I think we can find some groups and some names and some sectors, um, but I think the overall index is kind of stymied in this. We've been using like the 43, 4,400 range on the high side, maybe 3,700 uh, on the low side. That's probably too cute by half, but I think it's a general framework for how we're thinking about things. Right, and overall, it's been it's been an impressive runoff of the October lows. When you think about what 2023 most likely holds, just given the Fed and and all of the potential catalysts that that could provide, surprises as you're looking at the market, or is this following sort of the playbook you would expect given where we're at in that sort of cycle? Yeah, I'm not sure what the right playbook is. I yeah. I, I think we can. Um, it's funny you use the term impressive move off the low. I think parts of it have been impressive. Mm. But let, let me take the other side just for a minute. Um, let's say on October 12th, which was the low, let's say, Dave, you you called me up and you said, Chris, I'm telling you, today is the low. I see it. Today is the low. Go max long S&P. And let's say I said to you, no, Dave, you got this dead wrong. There, there's no way today's the low. We're in a devastating bear market. You might be max long S&P here. I'm going max long gold. Well, here we mm. are four mm. months later and we have the same return. So who's right? <laughs> So I, right? I I think this just gets to the point that this is a more nuanced environment than I think we're used to. There are certainly things we've liked off the low. We got, I would say, a, a, a pretty good expansion in the number of stocks making new highs. I wouldn't say it was the best I've ever seen, but it was certainly better. Um, you know, you, you, you mentioned the percent of stocks above the 200. I thought getting that back above 60 percent was an important threshold. We could check that box. But you know, on the other side, I, I'm used to you know, thinking about March of 09 or August of 82 or um, e even you know, April, May of 2020. Those initial four, five, six months off a low, I'm used to a rising tide, right? Mm. Everything goes up. Some stuff just goes up more, right? Cyclicals tend to lead yeah. the cost. They're going up more than defenses, but defenses are still going up. That's not quite what this is. Cyclicals have certainly been strong. We've seen it with semis. We've seen it with industrials. We've seen it with discretionary. But where are the youths? Where's pharma? Where are the staples? Where are the REITs? So it's not that I want to be dismissive of the leadership. I, I just mm -hmm. want to acknowledge um, major multi-year bottoms initially off that low is often a rising tide. I don't yeah. think we've quite met that threshold here. Doesn't mean it's not a good rally. Doesn't mean this window still isn't open, but it just looks a little different from that perspective. How much of that would you say is interest rates? Another chart we were talking about before was the yeah. was the ten year, right? And when you think about leadership, kind of traditional growth over value, I, I immediately think of looking at the yield curve, looking at the ten year. Is this the chart to be watching to make sense of of leadership, or how would you interpret that? Well, it, it's it's one of the few charts actually trending. Uh, yeah. Let's start there. <laughs> right. it, it, it's funny how. In this business, a couple weeks or two or three months of price action can kind of take you off, off the center, off the trends. And man, people were so convinced the high in yields were in. I counted yesterday, you had 22 countries that have made a new high in yields over the last several days. Wow. Sounds like the trend's up. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I think um, often in this business, we get very attached to the intellectualness of it or, or, or we get very drawn to a narrative, right? Whether that was disinflation kind of coming into this year or pivot last year or transitory the year before, let's let the market be the judge of what the correct narrative is. And I see uh, lower left to upper right on, on most yield charts. So I'm gonna say that trend in yields is, is still higher. And I think the equity market leadership reflects something of that magnitude as well, or, or of that score as well with, I mean, yields are terrible here. Um, yeah, you just go 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 stock by stock. Uh, next era is the largest weight in the utilities index. This has put in a major top. I think the next one might be Southern Company, uh, then Duke. I mean, your top three weights are are breaking down here. So you know, at a minimum, you look at this and you say, well, the Dow theorists can't be too thrilled about this. Mm -hmm. Remember, Dow theory is not just Dow and transports; it's Dow transports and and uh, and the youth. So there is a missing uh, piece here. Um, we know the staples. I think they've been indifferent at best. Some okay. Um, you know, Hershey's been okay. Procter Gamble not right. So very split. Pharma's yep. under a lot of pressure here. Even the ones that I think people viewed as largely untouchable, like a Lily. Oh, hey, yeah. 
everything's touchable. They're just stocks. Um, <laughs> so you kind of you kind of go rate sensitive group by rate sensitive group, and I I, I don't think it says two ninety ten year yields. Um, right. And you know, there's there's this view that you know inflation will fall this this year, and, and that's probably true. Who am I to say that it won't? But why does that mean that bond yields have to fall? I mean, we're still in this very unusual circumstance where ten-year yields trade at a deficit to headline CPI. That's odd. Um, I think mm. something like ninety percent of trading days since 1960, the ten-year yield's been in excess of the CPI. So why can't right, we have a three percent right, CPI right. and a four and a half uh, ten-year yield? That, that seems totally reasonable. And then, Dave, and as you know, uh, we we look at the world, right? Our our job is if it has a price, let's try and figure out what it means. I see Japanese bank strong. I see Euro bank strong. I don't think we're going back to the old interest rate regime. So we should right. change how we think about the world. Let's talk about some of the groups that actually are holding yeah. up pretty well. I mentioned steel companies before. Semiconductors have certainly had some strength off of the lows. With with areas like this, given some uncertainty in the markets, do you follow? I mean, would you stay with things like this that have been working and assume that that's the case until otherwise, or do you find cause for concern in some of these groups that have been, you know, pretty good leadership here in recent months? You know, I would think about it more the former. I say, listen, like what what has identified itself or emerged as leadership in a difficult year last year and has persisted this year, and the group that comes kind of top of mind is probably industrials. I know they're crowded and I know they're overbought and I get it. But I mean, a, a lot of these are making multi-year relative performance breakouts. And I, I'm not so naive to think if there is some big slowdown in the economy, you know, later this year, next year, that these won't be spared. But nothing gets spared in a recession. But in terms of identifying where your best chances at finding multi-year leadership is, and look at the relative breakouts in Parker Hannafin, Cummins, Eaton, Illinois Toolworks. Uh, we've been using this uh, silly acronym. Uh, we call it EPIC, uh, Eaton, Parker Hannafin, Illinois Tool Works, Cummins, uh, EPIC. I think that's the a new more... fang. It's the industrial fang, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd I like want... to say I, I thought of that that uh, all by myself, but I I had a little help um, coming up with that uh, with that acronym. Uh, it, it, but it's funny. I don't think we went through the last two years just to go back to the same stocks. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, history would 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 argue we, you you typically don't go through a multi year downturn. And well, well Chris, why multi year? It was just one year. Well, not really. Like all the speculative tech stuff peaked in early 21, and then just group by group by group by group, they hit them all through last year. So I would look to that as kind of a two year bear market. I don't think we went through that just to go back to the same stocks. Like mm. I know there's so much tech that kind of has this traditional bottoming look, you know, the the Shopify's and the squares, they all look like they're bottoming. I think that's the hook. I think what you got to focus on are not pictures that look like this, with, what's this arc, right? I yeah. Mean, it's yeah. tempting and I get it. I want to own Parker Hannafin. I want to own Cummins. I want to own US Steel. I want to own Komatsu in Japan. I want to own these European banks bringing out of decade long ranges. That I think is what the real story is and this is the trapping setter. This is the hook. Uh, who used that? Like, I, I think Ned Davis uh, used to use the language of what's the hook, right? Mm, um, yep. the, the the one thing that takes your eye off the ball, I think charts like this take your eye off where the ball really is. I think, you know, and you hit on it, Chris, I feel like it, it certainly seems like people are so anxious to go back to this bull market that they're familiar with, which is charts yeah. like this just start working and it's the emerging growth story. And, it, and if you look at what's actually working, it is. It's industrial names like Eaton that people probably are are underweight and under under familiar with, I would argue, more than anything, right? And and listen, I get it. They're expensive and they're overbought and all the above, uh, but they're still paying me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, who am I to say that um, maybe we're re-rating what the valuation should be? It, you know, it's funny. Um, no one ever cared that Google was expensive, or no one ever cared that mm. Apple was expensive. But oh man, they really care that Parker Hannafin's uh, expensive. I, I just <laughs> I find that interesting. Um, you you bring up Apple here, which uh, I guess the only right call here has been no right call for two years. Um, we we've just kind of sloshed this thing around, certainly for the last eighteen months. My gut says whether it's higher or lower the next thirty bucks, it doesn't do it as leadership. Uh, mm. That's kind of how I'm. I'm thinking about it. Um, I uh, 
I do think it's interesting that these moves, the, the very sharp rally you saw last summer, the very sharp rally you saw here last spring, the move we just saw the last, what, six, seven, eight weeks, don't they look so machine driven? It's like just up, 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 and then get stuck, fail a lower high. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I think at a minimum, I would want to see Apple kind of push through one section to change my tune here. Um, but Longs and shorts, I, I, I'm not really involved. I think the better shorts, Amazon. I think the better short here uh, is still Google. Yeah, this market cuts one of two ways. There are those names that were able to reclaim their 200-day moving average on this rally and those that have not. Um, and those that have not is not where I'm spending my time or my capital. Chris, I appreciate so much you coming on and particularly having a great reminder to focus on the trend and what's working and uh, and highlighting some of those areas that are doing it. It is great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show and I hope we can uh, do it again. Yeah, hope Chris. we can do it again soon. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thanks, Chris. That's Chris Barone. Chris is a, uh, a partner and head of technical and macro research at Stratega Securities in New York. What a great set of comments. If you think about where he was focusing on, this is what I've always loved about uh, Chris's work, immediately highlights the areas of the market that are showing strength, right? What's working? Forget about what should work, what could work, what a playbook is. I'm not sure of the playbook. I'm sure that these stocks are working and these are the ones I'd want to focus on. I think that's a refreshing way of thinking about technical analysis and a focus on relative strength. I hope you picked up on uh, on the importance of that in Chris's process. Great take there from Chris Verone at Strategus. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's hit on three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. When I'm talking with Chris Verone about charts that are working, I'm immediately drawn to steel companies. I'm looking at the groups that are working uh, today, the steel uh, index, the Dow industry group that we track up about two and a half percent today as the uh, major averages finished uh, narrowly in the red. This is our top rank industry using the stock chart scooter ranking. That doesn't happen by accident. That usually means that there's a sustained move over time that's causing strength. And the, the idea of trend following and the type of momentum investing we talk about is strength tends to beget further strength. So if you're looking for areas of the market for opportunities, I would argue, and I think Chris would most likely agree, look for areas that are showing strength. Steel's it, right? Making higher highs and higher lows, recently coming off of a higher low, and the relative strength about as good as I think you're going to find over the last four months. Chart number two in the semiconductor space, Applied Materials, AMAT. This is an earnings aim this week. A nice move to the upside, uh, gapping higher to around 116. That's up about 3.6% from yesterday. Today's move is not what really interests me, though. It's the fact that we've gone from a distribution phase of going below two downward sloping moving averages to a bit of a transition, and now in more of an accumulation phase. We're making higher highs and higher lows pulling back to an ascending 50-day moving average and rotating higher. The momentum is strong, but not excessive, and the relative strength is strong. I like names and areas of the market like this that are demonstrating their ability to perform well with sustained moves, not just one-off moves or one-day uh, fluctuations. Final chart I want to hit for you, and I didn't put it on my list, so I'll pull back to here, was looking at breadth, and in particular, we're going to look at the McClellan Oscillator. I was mentioning the idea of looking at breadth. And I love, again, Chris's comments about looking for strength and looking for areas of the market where you're seeing their ability to outperform. I think recognizing that there are individual names and groups that are working is important. Also thinking about the overall momentum of the markets as driven by market breadth. When more groups are struggling than thriving, it's tough for our benchmarks to be uh, to be moving higher. I'm concerned by some of the negative moves we've seen in uh, in some of these breadth indicators. I'm not seeing a breakdown yet in the major indexes. It's currently holding support, but a day like today certainly is making me eye those risk levels to see what lines in the sand I need to clearly define and set alerts to track them. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Chris Verone of Strategus joining us from New York. All of our previous interviews and lots of great episodes can be found at stockchartstv.com or on our YouTube channel. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, be well, we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.